Let's praise the Lord. That was so good. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. And it's good to be with you guys this morning. It's been a little while. We had a missions fest, which was so, so good. So good to hear from Luther and from Pastor Kevin and hear what God is doing both around the world and across the street. Uh, I'm so thankful for the time that we had to pause, um, but I'm also really excited to jump back in and jump back into what's happening right here and, and what God's doing um, in and through TVC and jumping into this brand new series that we have. For those of you who have no idea who I am, my name is Chad Lowe. I'm one of the pastors here at this church. I'm, I'm the interim campus pastor here. And if this is your first time here, I just want to say welcome. We are so, so glad you're here. I'm so thankful that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. And I would love to greet you personally. I'll be standing outside the steps after the service. I'd love to shake your hand and get to know you. And just thank you for, for being here. And church, uh, I, I want to actually challenge us as we step into this, this new season for TVC, as we step into this transitional phase of TVC, I, I want to challenge you. Is that okay? Okay. So what I want to challenge you is that you would be people who are praying. I want to challenge you that we would be a praying people, that we would be praying for whoever the Lord is going to bring to lead this church, whoever the Lord's going to bring to, to be the campus pastor, be praying for what God is still doing right now in and through TVC, be praying that what God is doing in your life and how he is going to use you in the community. Let TVC be known as people who pray. That's the challenge. Let's be praying people. Amen? Amen. Well, I'm really excited that we're jumping into this new series called What Would You Ask Jesus? It's going to be a four-week series leading into our, our Christmas series, which is coming soon. It feels like it, but, um, but leading into this. And so we're going to actually look at four different encounters that people had with Jesus in the book of John. Four different encounters and questions that people came to Jesus with, and then Jesus' response to those questions. And so today, we're actually going to be in John chapter 1, John chapter 1, starting in verse 43. And so if you would open your Bibles with me to John chapter 1, verse 43. John is the fourth gospel in the New Testament in the, the latter half of the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we're going to see this encounter, this, this question that Jesus was presented um, and his response as we look together. So if you are with me, say amen. amen. All right, would you please stand for the reading of God's word? We stand out of respect and reverence for the word of God. Starting in verse 43, it says this. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, were from the town of Bethsaida. Philip, and Nathaniel, Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one that Moses wrote about in the law, the one whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked, come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you. As we just sang, we thank you for how you love us, Lord. We thank you that you gave us your son, Jesus. We thank you that not only do you hear our questions, not only do you respond to the doubts and the skepticism that we have, Lord, but that you love us. Lord, you love to reveal yourself to us and that we get to encounter you. Lord, through the power of your spirit, you make your word known to us. Through the power of your spirit, you show us yourself. And so, Lord, we ask today that you would do that. Lord, show us yourself. Be glorified today. Be glorified in the reading of your word and the preaching of your word and the songs that we sing. Be glorified in the way that we live our lives, Lord. Challenge us, convict us, draw us to yourself. I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart would be pleasing to you, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. So, as I mentioned, we're, we're looking at this encounter with Jesus, particularly from the earliest moments of Jesus meeting his disciples. 
and particularly looking at Philip and Nathaniel. Philip and Nathaniel and the encounter that they had. And, and the big question that really is being asked that we see Nathaniel ask is, he asks two questions, one to Philip and one to Jesus. And the question he asks to Philip is, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? And then he asks Jesus, how do you know me? And really what Nathaniel is wondering, is this guy really the Messiah? Is he really God? Is he really the one that we were looking for? And maybe today you're asking that question. You're sitting here and go, I don't really know if I buy into this thing. I don't know if I buy into Jesus like you guys do. And so I just don't know. Well, we're going to talk about that. We're going to explore that together through Nathaniel's questioning. And maybe you're like, I've actually been following Jesus for a while now, maybe for a long time, maybe for a short time. But what do I do now? What do I do next? And we're going to talk about that. What does it mean to encounter Jesus and how does that change and transform our lives? That's the question that we're going to be looking at today. And so actually throughout the entire book of John, John is is not ashamed at all. He starts out from the very beginning explaining that Jesus is the Lord, that he is the Messiah. And in John chapter 20, we actually see his thesis for his whole book. John was one of the disciples of Jesus, and we see his whole thesis for this book. So you put on the screen, John chapter 20, verse 31, he says this, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah. This is the whole point that I wrote this book, that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. That's my prayer today, that we would believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, and we would find life in his name. So we're going to unpack this together. We're going to unpack the, this, this goal and focus of John. We're going to unpack this question together by looking at these three points. We're going to look at three people from this encounter, from this encounter with Jesus. We're going to start by looking at the servant, then we're going to look at the skeptic, and then we're going to look at the Savior. The servant, the skeptic, and the Savior. So let's start by looking at the servant. So Jesus comes up, he finds Philip, and he says two earth-shattering, life-altering, transforming words. He says, follow me. Follow me. Where? Follow you where, Jesus? When? Now? Who are you? I don't know you. Where are you going? How long is it going to be until we get back? What do I need? Uh, Why? Maybe you've asked those questions before. Follow me. Uh, What's it going to look like? Follow me. But Philip doesn't do that. He just goes. Isn't that wild to think about? When you pause and think about it, he says, follow me, and he just goes. He doesn't ask questions, and if he does, we don't read about it. We don't see it. But this isn't the first time that this kind of thing happens, where someone just gets up, goes, and follows Jesus without any questions. Actually, we see just a few short verses before in verse 35. It says this, The next day John, that's John the Baptist, not John the author here, was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Just like that. They went up and they followed. And we learn a little bit later that one of those disciples is actually the disciple of Jesus named Andrew. So they go and they follow And what we see is that what Andrew does is he just gets up and he goes and he follows Jesus just like Philip. They go and they follow Jesus. And guys, we are called to do the same. We are called to follow Jesus. The message is the same for us. Go. Follow me. Two transformational words. Follow me. But What stops us? What causes us to wait, to pause, to not follow? What are the questions that you may have, that we have, that prevent us from getting up like Philip and Andrew and going? Is there a barrier? Is there something standing in the way? We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But what's wild is that what we see from when 
Philip follows Jesus, he goes and he follows, then the very next thing that they do, and I think that this is actually the very thing that we should do. This is our mission. You might be wondering, I'm following Jesus. I've been following Jesus for a long time. Now what? What, what, what do I do next? Like, I got the whole following down. We've been, we've been going, but what do I do next? The very first thing that Andrew and Philip do is they go and tell. The very first thing. They see that Jesus is the Messiah. They see that he is the son of God and they go, they follow, and then they tell. But we kind of get stuck at the follow part, don't we? We, we, we find all these reasons to, to not go and tell. We, we, we follow, but the telling part, well, uh, that's a little dicey. But not for Andrew, not for Philip. When they see that they've encountered God himself, they have to tell people. And not only do they tell people, they tell probably two of the most difficult groups of people to tell. Andrew goes to his family, and Philip goes to his closest friends. Now, these are the two probably most important people that we should go tell, but it's difficult, isn't it? Andrew goes to his brother, Peter, and he brings him to Jesus. Now, Peter is named Simon before this, and then Jesus renames him Peter. And then Philip goes to his buddy, Nathaniel. They go and they tell. But there's a lot of reasons why we don't, right? I think it's interesting when we, we, we tell people about all sorts of different things in our lives. If we like a certain movie, you're going to hear about it. If I liked a certain Froyo place, you'll hear about it. If I got a good deal at Kohl's, you're going to hear about it, right? We, we, we like to tell people about all sorts of things that happen in our lives. We, we, in fact, we have, we have a whole network devoted to it called social media, where we just tell people things. Heck, we tell people what we don't like. We tell everybody everything. But then we encounter Jesus, and we're silent. We encounter Jesus, and all of a sudden it's like, uh, I don't know if I should tell people about that. I mean, he changed my life. Don't get me wrong. Amen, hallelujah. But... Well, you can find out for yourself. Good luck. People get passionate to tell you about the things that happen, even things that don't matter. I told a lot of people about the Washington Nationals winning the World Series. I don't care about the Washington Nationals. <laughs> but do we tell people about Jesus? Do we like Philip? Is that our first thing? Or is that the last on the list? For many of us, it's the last on the list. And I think that there's barriers for us. I think there's barriers that prevent us, that keep us, that inhibit us, that stop us, that stalemate us from going and telling people about Jesus. That we've encountered the, 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 the living God, we've encountered the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but now go tell him. It's like, well, wait. And I think that there's, there's so many reasons, but I think there's two I want to focus on today. One is the fear of man, and the other is pride. The fear of man keeps us from going and telling because what if it's not received well? What if it shapes the way that you think about me? What if the way that I tell you ends up ruining the friendship? What if me telling others about Jesus, what if me telling my friends and my family actually ends it. Think about if Andrew or Philip were worried about the, the fracturing of their relationship when they told them about Jesus. What if Peter said, dude, you're insane. No, like leave me alone. What if Nathaniel said, no, nah, I don't really want to be friends with you. I don't like to be friends with crazy people. And so we actually allow the fear of man to prevent us from displaying the love of God. And it's a really a heart issue, isn't it? It shows us that deep down in the core of our being, there is something that we love more than God. And you might go, yeah, others. No, it's you. You love you more than God. And you don't want to lose the things that make you feel better. And it's all potential, right? We don't tell people because we're afraid of the potential loss rather than the actual redemption that we've received. Fear of man is a really scary thing. And what's interesting is it actually limits what the potential impact could be. What, what, what's crazy about this, when Andrew brings his brother Peter to Jesus, 
he had no idea how God was going to use Peter. Peter is arguably one of the most famous disciples of Jesus. That at the day of Pentecost, Peter preached a sermon of the good news of the gospel. And on that day, thousands came to know Jesus. All because Andrew brought his brother to Jesus. There's actually another amazing transformational example of someone who is brought to Jesus. And I'm going to, it's a guy named Edward Kimball. And I'm going to read this story for you because it's, it's remarkable. But it would have been halted if the fear of man took over Edward Kimball. Edward Kimball was a timid, soft-spoken man, very opposite of a bold evangelist. He met a salesman who was crude and illiterate, but God laid it on Kimball's heart to speak to him about Jesus. So Kimball headed to the shoe store, uncertain about whether he should be going during business hours, and really unclear about what he would say. He was so preoccupied about what he was going to say that he actually walked right past the store. Upon realizing this, he quickly turned around and determined to get it over with, dashed in. He found the young man selling, shelving shoes in the stockroom, and as he later remembered it, he spoke with what he calls limping words. And he said, I never could really remember exactly what I said. Something about Christ and his love, but that was all. It was, in his judgment, a weak appeal. But God used this witness so that that young man gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And it's because of that man that I'm actually here. Because that man was D.L. Moody. And I, my wife, some of you, Will and his wife, studied there. Because of him, he's actually one of the greatest evangelists in the last 100, 200 years. In Britain and in America. And it was because this timid man had to go and tell. He didn't allow the fear of man to inhibit the love of God. The second barrier that we have is pride. We can come up with all the reasons why, you know, it's just, I'm working on my relationship with Jesus. You know, I just, I got to work on God and me. And, and then, then I can go, right? I, I just need to make sure that he and I are good. Like, I got some sin issues I got to work out. And then once those are figured out, then, then I can go and tell, right? I want to I present a finished product. Like, look at me. God can do this to you too. Amen and amen. <laughs> and so we let our pride stop us from telling because we're all consumed with ourselves. Or we let our circumstances, I'm just, you wouldn't believe what I have going on right now. Like, when am I going to have time to go tell people? I have all of these things. I have 17 kids. I have, I have all these jobs and I have to figure out all of these things. And so busyness prevents us from going and sharing because we're so consumed with what we're doing, we aren't resting in what has been done. We let pride stop us. But not only do we think highly of ourselves, we think lowly of ourselves. But we're still thinking about ourselves. And so we don't go and tell because we're like, I just don't know if I'm like the best person to share. I'm not like an evangelist or a preacher. and I haven't been trained. So I don't know how to go and share. We're still consumed with ourselves. Guys, it's not about your work. It's about what Christ has done. We tell because we're not telling about we, what we do. We're telling about what Christ has done. We're bringing people to Jesus. Don't let the fear of man, don't let pride inhibit your presentation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Philip didn't. Andrew didn't. And thousands came to know Jesus. So now that we've seen the servant, we've seen Andrew, we've seen Philip as these faithful servants who, who immediately heard the call to follow and they followed. And not only did they follow, but they went and told. Let's look at the skeptic. Maybe, maybe this resonates with a few more of you here. We see what happens when, Nathan, when Philip goes to Nathaniel and he says, we have found the one that Moses wrote about in the law. We found him, the one who the prophets told. His name is Jesus. He's from Nazareth. He's the son of Joseph. And listen to like Nathaniel's snarky, cynical response. He hears this and he isn't like, wow, that's awesome. He says, Nazareth, are you kidding me? Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? Like, it's not like, wow, Philip, that's amazing. Nazareth, really? And so we see that Nathaniel has a predisposition, a prejudice 
against this place. He isn't focused on who Jesus is. He's focused on where he's from. And so he's stuck. He's hung up. He's cynical. I don't know that Jesus could be from Nazareth. You know, Galilee was kind of a podunk place, the, the, the region of, of Galilee, but Nazareth was like the hillbilly of the podunk place. Like, it was the town that you didn't really want to be from. It's like, oh, he's from Nazareth. Makes sense. So it had this reputation. And Nathaniel is saying, uh, isn't Jesus supposed to be born of Bethlehem? Isn't the Messiah supposed to come from there? He was a smart guy. He knew the Torah. He knew the law. But Nazareth was also a rival town. He saw Nazareth as a place where people were simple, unintelligent, unsophisticated. Isn't that kind of how Christianity is viewed today in our world? That, oh, you believe in Jesus? So cute. Does the Easter Bunny still give you stuff? That's awesome. Christianity is seen as for the simple, the unsophisticated, the unintelligent. But smart people like us, we know better, right? We've reasoned, we've, we've, we've thought, and, and it can't be true. This is all fairy tale. This is myth. This is mythology. This isn't real. But it is. But it is. And Jesus came from Nazareth. And I think for us, we can have different forms of cynicism when it comes to God. Maybe, like I said at the very beginning, you're here and you're like, I still don't know if I buy into this whole Christianity thing. Maybe you're here and you're going, I'm still not sold on Jesus. Maybe your cynicism, maybe your doubt, maybe your skepticism isn't on, is Jesus the Messiah, but is he big enough to conquer the problem I'm facing? Is, is, I, 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 yeah, I believe that Jesus is, is Lord, but do you understand like, what's going on at work? Do you understand the financial situation I'm in? Do you understand the re- relational estrangement that I'm facing? Is God big enough for that? I, I believe that he's Lord, but does he care? I believe that he's Lord, but does he love me? Does he see me? Does he know me? And that's exactly what Philip is saying. We've been waiting We've been waiting since the beginning of man for this guy to show up. We've been waiting for the promised redeemer. We've been waiting for the one who's going to crush the head of the serpent. We've been waiting for the ruler whose scepter will never depart from him. We've been waiting for the king of kings and lord of lords. We've been waiting for the one that the law of Moses said would be fulfilled. We've been waiting for the the one that the prophets have said is going to come and he's going to restore Israel. And we found him. His name is Jesus. And he says, but he's from Nazareth. So I'm wondering, what what are the inhibitions that are keeping you? What are the inhibitions that are keeping you from following, from trusting, from seeing Jesus as Lord? What are the barriers that are standing between you and God? What I love is Philip's response to this. Because Nathaniel comes with skepticism, with cynicism, with doubts. And Philip doesn't get personal. He doesn't get offended. He doesn't, he doesn't start arguing. He doesn't list out this whole apologetic of why Jesus fulfills all the prophecies, why Jesus fulfills the law of Moses. He just says a simple response. Come and see. Come and see. Simple as that. You have doubts? Cool. Come and see. See for yourself. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to come and see? Maybe your inhibitions, maybe your disposition has prevented you from coming and seeing yourself. You've already written God off. You've already written him off from the problem. But like Philip, I'm asking, come and see. Don't take my word for it. Look for yourself. Search him. Find him. Tim Keller would say, are you willing to doubt your doubts? Are you willing to doubt your doubts? Are you willing to take your inhibitions aside and say, I'm just looking for truth? You know, there's actually a man who, there's actually several accounts of this, but one that I I particularly love, so I'm going to share that one, um, of someone who also doubted that Jesus Christ was real, 
And, and actually, this, this guy, he was really good friends with another guy, and these, both, both of these guys were authors, and, and um, they were talking about stories and story writing and just kind of telling stories back and forth to one another. And the one man was like, oh, I just, I love the beauty of stories, but Jesus ruins it. Christianity just ruins the best stories. Like, it, it, if, if I believe in God, then it's going to be boring and drab, and it's going to make all of my stories boring as well. And Sven replied with, no, no, it won't at all. When you know God, then the stories enhance. When you know God, the stories become infinitely better. When you know God, then you know what true beauty, true romance, true love is. When you know God, you find true creativity. This man going, I don't buy it, set out to write an entire book disproving Christianity, disproving God, and in the process, found Jesus himself. And he has written some of the most prolific books of the last century. His name is C.S. Lewis. And his friend was J.R.R. Tolkien. Kind of wild, right? So if you're a nerd, this is like a cool moment. Like this is just (laughs) super, super awesome. But we've benefited from a man who searched for himself. And there are many, many, many other stories of people who have searched and found God. So my question is, are you willing to search? Will you come and see? Will you find out for yourself? Or are you going to go, he's from Nazareth. I'm sorry. I just, I can't. I won't. I can't believe it. Come and see. But I think that there's a few barriers that prevent us from coming and seeing. Whether it's coming and seeing that Jesus is Lord or trusting him to take care of our problems or, or trusting that he is big enough to, to handle my life's circumstances. And I think that th- there's a lot of different barriers, but the one that I want to focus on is our experiences. Maybe not even it's our experiences, but the experiences of the world around us. And so we, we, we go, man, I hear that God's loving, but did you, did you hear about what happened here? I, I hear that God's sovereign, he's in control of everything, but what about this? I, I hear that God is good, but what about that time? No, no, you don't know what home I grew up in. You don't know what, what life I've lived. You don't, you don't know the neighborhood that I was a part of. If God is good, then how could I be there? If God is good, how could this happen to me? If God is loving, then why is my life like this? You might be sitting here and going, yeah, that's exactly where I'm at. That's exactly where I'm at. And sometimes our experiences actually inhibit us. We, we, we've come to God and said, instead of searching for him, we've already declared over him that you're not loving. You're not good. You're not sovereign. You don't have control. Because if you did, this wouldn't have happened. We don't give God an, ans- an opportunity to actually show himself to us. We don't come and see because we believe that we've seen enough. Are your experiences, are your circumstances, which are all valid and real, are they inhibiting you from coming and seeing for yourself? Because Jesus says, all who seek me will find me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you might go, okay, how do I come and see? What does that look like for me? What, what do I do? What, is, what does it mean to come and see Well, it's pretty simple. I would say that it starts with prayer. Pray that God would show himself to you. Now, this isn't just going, okay, God, I guess if you're there, whatever, kind of show yourself, but I'm not really. No, are you searching? Are you you willing to say, God, I want to encounter you. I want to see you. I want to know you. Will you show yourself to me? Will you show yourself to me? Because I want to know. I want to know you. I want to encounter you. Do you want to search? It starts with prayer. The second way is go to God's word. See what he says about himself. See what he says about you. See what he says about what he has done on your behalf. Search him out. And I'm confident you will find him. If you're willing. What's beautiful here, now that we've seen the, the servant, the, the people who followed Jesus just like that, we've seen the skeptic who had questions and had doubts and is like, but he's from Nazareth and ah, I just don't know. I, I don't know if I can get over this. Now we look at the response of the Savior. 
Let's look at the response of Jesus Christ, the response of the Savior. And, and it's so beautiful. When, when Nathaniel, he, he goes, okay, fine, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go with you, Philip. We're going to go and we're going we're to see Jesus. And when Jesus sees Nathaniel approaching, he engages, he initiates. He doesn't wait for Nathaniel to come to him, but he says, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Now, he's not being facetious. He's not being sarcastic. He's not coming and he's like, oh, here's a, the best of the best. Come at me. No, he is being honest. He's saying, Nathaniel, you're a man of high character. Nathaniel, you are a true Israelite. He speaks to him and, and he speaks to him affirmations. But Nathaniel responds with, how do you know me? Think about this for a moment. Think about this question and who he is asking it to. How do you, Jesus Christ, know me? Wild. He could have said, um, I created you. I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were a thought, I knew you. I know you better than yourself. I know your sin issues. I know your insecurities. I know your dreams and desires. I know what will happen tomorrow. I know what happened in your past. I know you better than you could ever know you. And I love you. I know you from the top down and I love you. He's asking him, how do you know me? And Jesus could have said, you have no idea. But instead he answers simply. He says, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Before anyone was around, I saw you. Now, what's interesting here, is, and what, what commentators said is, is that if, if this was a, a work of fiction, if this was an account to try to just convince people that Jesus was, was real and that he's God, you never would include this story, this account, this moment. You would never include what Jesus said here. Why? Because we don't know what was happening under the fig tree. It, it seems so small because after this, Nathaniel declares, Rabbi, you're the son of God. You saw what was happening under the fig tree. Clearly you're God. And we're like, uh-huh, what? How is that? That doesn't make sense. Oh, you... I saw you at Taco Bell. Sweet, cool, you must be God. <laughs> like, it just, it doesn't add up. You would only include this if it really happened. You would only include this if this was his true testimony. You would only include this if Nathaniel truly surrendered to the Lord right here. And he did. I saw you under the fig tree before Philip was there. And he's like, you know. You know. You know what, what? The reason that Nathaniel is responding is because Jesus is showing himself to be the good shepherd. He's showing himself to be the good shepherd who knows his sheep and his sheep know him. And he calls out to his sheep in a way that his sheep know. Notice that when Jesus encounters all four of these disciples, he does it differently. The message is still the same. It's still come and follow me. But his method is very different. He walks by and John proclaims, look, the Lamb of God, and Andrew follows. Andrew brings Peter before Jesus, and he says, this is the Son of God, and Peter follows. Jesus goes directly to Philip and says, hey, follow me, and he follows. Philip brings Nathaniel, and Nathaniel questions him. How do you know me? And he responds in a way that Nathaniel understands. I think back to when I knew that the Lord was calling me to himself. I read through the Gospel of Matthew and I was like, I've been professing this my whole life, but I don't have a relationship with this Jesus. And I prayed, Lord, show yourself to me. And it was as if he was speaking directly to me, saying, I love you, I know you, and I want you. I'm all in. Whatever you want, Lord, I'm yours. I I'm it. Like the the all I'm all in. You have everything. Have all of it. You know, Jesus isn't looking for recruits. This isn't like Uncle Sam saying, I want you for the army. Look, so and so many strong Christianity. Um, instead, we know that Jesus is seeking and saving the lost. He calls you by name. He wants you to not experience the punishment of sin. He wants you to be loved and cared for by him, the good shepherd. He knows you. And you may be wondering, God, do you know me today? 
Do you care about me? Do you care about my circumstances? Are you big enough? And he's saying, you have no idea. And that's the beauty of this next part. Because when Nathaniel responds, Jesus says, you believe because I told you that I saw you under a fig tree. You will see greater things than that. Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, what Jesus is referencing here, the the beautiful part is when he calls out to Nathanael, he says, here is an Israelite of whom there is no deceit. It's wild because the nation of Israel was started by a man named Jacob, known as the deceiver. He was a man of deceit right? Jacob was a man of deceit, but when he encountered God at a place called Bethel, he saw this, he, he dreamt, he was running and fleeing from his brother Esau. He was running and fleeing away because he had tricked his brother into giving him his birthright. And then he, as he was laying there, he dreamt that this stairway came from heaven and touched down to earth, and that these angels were ascending and descending back and forth from heaven to earth. And God called out and he says, I know you. I am with you. I will provide for you. These angels are servants to minister to you. I will be your God. And then when Jacob wrestles with God, he changes his name from Jacob to Israel. And then he says to Nathanael, here is a true Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Unlike Jacob, now Israel. But even beyond that, Jesus is saying to Nathanael, that ladder, that bridge between heaven and earth, that access to the throne room of God, that's me. I am him. I am the ladder. And my ladder is a cross. I am bringing heaven to earth. I have come so that you can experience the fullness of the glory of God that you will be ministered to by the angels. I am the Son of Man. I have come that you may experience life and life to the full. I am the latter. You believe because I told you I saw you. You haven't seen anything yet. And what he's saying to us is that we get to receive the benefit of the finished work of Christ. We get to receive the benefit of the finished work of Jesus. The beautiful thing is that throughout this entire chapter, Jesus is called seven different names, all of them pointing to the beauty of the fulfillment of the gospel of Jesus Christ. At the beginning, he's called the Lagos. He is the word made flesh. And he was there at the beginning. All things were made through him and in him. He is the lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice atoning for our sins. He is rabbi, our good teacher. His message is the good news of the gospel. It is good news, not good advice. He is the Messiah. He is the one that fulfills the law of Moses, the one whom the prophets foretold. He is the perfect representative for us to God. He is the son of God for he is divine. For he is God himself. He has all authority because he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He is the King of Israel. He is the great ruler who leads his people with justice and with grace. And he is the Son of Man. He is the perfect representative on our behalf. His kingdom will never pass away. And he is coming again. Amen. This is Jesus. The question for us today is if you're skeptical, Will you come and see? Do you know that Jesus is saying to you, just like he did to them, follow me. And in following him, will you go and tell of the wondrous things that he has done? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank you that you know us, that you love us, that you see us. Lord, we thank you that you give us yourself. We thank you that you aren't afraid or hurt or, or angry at our questions, God, but that you, you meet them with yourself, Lord. Like Nathaniel, you showed yourself to him. Lord, I pray that you would show yourself here right now. Lord, that we would follow you and that we would proclaim the goodness of your salvation wherever we are. pray this in your name. Amen. So now we come to the table of grace. We come to communion, um, and I love, I love that we get to have communion uh, once a month. Actually, I would love to have it all the time, but, but it's okay. Once a month, we'll do. Um, 
For those of you who are new to TBC, we believe that Scripture holds two ordinances. One is baptism. That's a one-time thing that out of the, the profession of our faith, we are baptized, representing the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then an ongoing ordinance is the, the Lord's Supper, the communion table where we believe that we get to, to reflect on this symbol of the incredible love that Jesus has given us in his gospel. The Lord's Supper reminds us again of his finished work at the cross, and it's a reminder that he's used to assure us in our walk with him and to stir up faith anew. The Lord's Supper, as it states in Scripture, is meant to be a remembrance of what Jesus has accomplished at the cross and in the passage that we're going to read in a moment from 1 Corinthians, Paul explains us God's promises that this table is the perfect picture of it and that we uh, don't believe these elements are actually the body and blood of Jesus, but they are symbols of the, the body that was shed and the blood that was shed for us. The bread represents his body broken on our behalf and the juice is a symbol of the blood that was shed for us. We do juice here, not wine, so just so you guys know. But in light of Scripture, we believe that the Lord's Supper is only for those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. Actually, uh, later on in the same passage, it says that um, if you partake in the Lord's Supper, but you, you don't profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that you're actually heaping condemnation on you. And so we ask that if you don't profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that you would abstain from, from partaking in the elements. But, but use this time to pray. As we talked about just a moment ago, pray that the Lord would show himself to you. And maybe you too would come to know Jesus for the first time. That you know Jesus is your Lord. That he knows you. That he loves you. And that he sacrificed himself for you. And instead that you would, and so in a moment we're going we're gonna to have a moment of silence and we're going to take some time to pray. To reflect on what God has done. To reflect on the finished work of Jesus at the cross. And you can take this time to pray that God would show himself to you. The ushers will come and distribute the plates in a moment. You'll receive, there's two cups. There's one with juice and one with a cracker in it, and you'll separate those as we tell you. Um, but don't take them just yet. We'll, we'll move through that in a moment, um, and I'll lead you through that. And at the very end, after we, we take, we're going to sing a worship song to the Lord. So would you please uh, join me in taking a moment of silence, coming before the Lord and praying to him. <laughs> 